First, I'd like to thank Alex and the other organizers for inviting us all to this wonderful conference. Um, this particular talk will describe the, the work I did in Dale Van Harlingen's lab at the University of Illinois as a postdoc uh, in order to try to engineer a topological superconductor. And we do that by taking a conventional uh, superconductor, a wave superconductor ni like niobium, and placing it in contact with the three-dimensional topological insulator business selenide. Uh, in particular, in this talk, I'll describe our efforts to probe the phase coherent transport through these sort of hybrid systems in order to eventually create a, an interferometer that can detect the Meyer on a bounce states that are, that, that are hoped to exist in this type of system. Uh, before moving on, I'd like to thank my collaborators, particularly Gian Kurter, another postdoc, uh, formerly postdoc uh, at, at Illinois. She has her no own group now. Um, she helped me with the fabrication and measurement of these devices. Also, special thanks to Puyang Gami for theoretical help. Uh, Yusan Hor, a grower who, who created the, the single crystal business selenide uh, that we used. And of course, Dale Van Hollingen, my, my um, advisor. So I'm sure lots of other people have, um, I mean, th throughout this conference, we've heard a lot about Meyer and fermions, um, but it, I thought it would be helpful to sort of re to uh, go over it once again, uh, particularly because in the previous talk, they focused on the one-dimensional systems, and it would be nice to talk about how Meyer and fermions can actually emerge in a higher-dimensional system, where they'll be actually be bound to vortices in the, in the topological insulator. So describe how, how um, that might occur. Um, <coughs> Then we'll describe measurements of phase coherent transport. First of all, looking for, at a Fabry Pro interference when we take uh, two s closely spaced leads, one superconducting and one normal, and places on top of a thin flake of a topological insulator. And these two leads are close enough, we can actually get quasi ballistic transport between the two, and that gives a prominent Fabry Pro interference. You can see how these fa Fabry Pro resonances interact with Andreev reflection. And then, time permits, I'll also describe. Um, our rudimentary measurements of Aronov Bohm type interferometry in these unusual um, hybrid devices where we actually have a single superconductor uh, disk on top of the topological insulator, all between two very cl closely spaced normal metallic leads. We're trying to flow current around this, this superconductor and see what sort of interesting phase coherence transport can, can occur and, what, and how it can be linked to the search for Meyer and fermions. Uh, as I'm sure you're all familiar, um, that. Um, way back in the early days of quantum theory, Majorana wrote down his Majorana equation. That includes both the original field operator and the charge conjugate of that field operator. This is in order to des de, um, describe neutral uh, fermions uh, because it permits only solutions that are, that are real. This Majorana equation is typically supplemented with the condition that the solutions to it uh, is identical to its own antiparticle. That is, the annihilation and creation of operators are identical. And this is known, as, of course, as a Majorana fermion. You can write down the Majorana operators in terms of Dirac operators. And most importantly, you can write down a single Dirac operator in, in terms of two separate Majorana fermion operators. That's because a Dirac fermion has four degrees of freedom based on the spin and whether you have a particle or antiparticle. But Majorana fermions, you sort of lose that par particle antiparticle uh, degree of freedom. Now, of course, it's, it's an open question of whether or not Meyer fermions exist in nature as fundamental particles. But it's been recently appreciated that if you have a solid state system with particle hole symmetry, for example, annihilation or an, uh, and creation operators obey this, this relationship, if that system has a zero energy mode, you can see that that, that annihilation and creation operator is identical and is essentially is its own antiparticle and thus it acts like a Majorana fermion. One system where this particle hole symmetry emerges naturally is within superconductivity. You have a gap based on the superconducting gap. And if you have some sort of defect, for example, a magnetic flux vortex, then you have states encircling it. And that's, those states will have a, a, a discrete spectrum of energies, every, uh, energy, every state at positive energy having a corresponding state at ne negative energy. And for a conventional superconductor, such as niobium or aluminum, there will typically be a very small gap. There won't be a, a zero energy state. This gap is supposed to be, supposed to be very small, something like uh, delta squared over the Fermi energy. And so it's typically too, uh, too small to be observed directly with, it, say, an STM. However, if you have a P-wave superconductor, there the pairing, um, the Cooper pairs, have this additional uh, phase winding as you go around the Brulon zone. And then this additional phase winding causes a shift in the boundary conditions when you consider states encircling the magnetic flux vortex. And that causes a zero energy mode to appear. And this is the Majorana fermion. Um, as was mentioned earlier, the, the reason why Majorana fermions are interesting 
to the community is that you can actually uh, realize non-abelian exchange statistics. If you have a pair of myron fermions, they can des describe a, a delocalized uh, Dirac fermion state that can be either occupied or unoccupied, and that can be formed the basis of a, what is known as a topological qubit. You can do non-local operations by taking one of those myron fermions and moving it around the other. This will, will acquire a, f um, a phase shift, but the other one won't, and that causes th the Dirac state to become flipped from one occupation number to another. And these sort of braiding operations are supposed to be very robust because the final um, answer doesn't depend on the exact details of these braiding operations, but rather just whether the, the number and order of the operations. And so you can actually create this really robust topological quantum computer that is immune to most forms of decoherence. So the que next question is, how do you actually detect the myron fermions? There's a variety of proposals. Um, the simplest one is just a spectroscopy measurement. You can take your STM tip, for example, and tunnel into um, the center of one of these, these defects and look for, hopefully, a zero bias conductance peak. And indeed, there's been a number of preliminary results on uh, one-dimensional systems, nanowires, and chains of ferromagn ferromagnetic uh, atoms, which is all very, uh, um, very stimulating. But the problem is that, um, as one paper put it, zero bias conductance peaks are, peaks are remarkably unremarkable. And there's a host of other effects unrelated to myron fermions that can cause this peak. And so you would like to have a more unambiguous detection. One way to do that is to, to do a non-local measurement in order to, do, to look for the non-local states that are encoded by these pairs of myron or fermions. One such experiment is to do an inter interference experiment, where, you, can, where you, you stream a bunch of quantum particles, such as charges or vortices, around your collection of myron fermions and have them recombine and interfere with each other. And then if you do your braiding operation, and, and that causes a, a shift of the occupation of that uh, delocalized uh, Dirac fermion, then hopefully you should see some corresponding shift in your interference signal. So that's the ultimate goal. This is a really simplified version of, of, of um, the actual, actual proposals. So there have been a number of proposals for P-wave superconducti superconductors. Um, so, some of them are quote unquote naturally occurring, simple uh, compounds such as strontium ruthenate. Uh, certain fractional quantile states, of course, five halves, which is historically the first system, I believe, that was actually uh, proposed to even have non-abelian exchange statistics. Uh, but in recent years, it's been, um, it's been appreciated you can actually take semiconductors with strong speed orbit coupling and, and connect them to superconductors. You can actually get a robust, robust form of, of P-wave superconductivity that can be easily tuned, such as indium arsenide or in, indium antimonide nanowires with large Zeeman splitting, certain quantum wells uh, that'll, that form two-dimensional topological insulators. Um, you, of course, heard about them earlier about, uh, in this conference, but the focus of this talk will be on the, the proposals centered on the three-dimensional topological insulators, such as business selenide or business telluride. As you're probably aware, uh, three-dimensional topological insulators are insulators uh, they have, that have a band gap, which means that in the bulk there are no delocalized states. But due to the band inversion from the strong spit orbit coupling, that causes a, um, a set of protected gapless states on the surface. These gapless states have a, a Dirac-like dispersion, much like graphene, and they have this helical spin texture, meaning that the direction of the spin is locked to be per per perpendicular to the momentum. And one nice thing is that uh, this, this spin texture, this, uh, this dispersion has been directly observed through ARPIS measurements qu uh, quite prominently. So that the, the experimental existence of these three-dimensional topological insulators is very well established. So soon after three-dimensional, these topological insulators were discovered, people wondered what would happen if you were induced superconductivity. It turns out you get something that's, that's much like P-wave. Because if you consider um, Cooper pairing of electrons on the opposite side of the Brulon zone and you, and you rotate them around the Brulon zone, because the spins of the electrons rotate around, you get this additional Berry phase. And thus, um, the Cooper pairs have this intrinsic 2 pi uh, winding from this, from this Berry phase. That's the hand-waving exp uh, explanation. Uh, for a uh, more rigorous way, you can just rewrite the problem in terms of the helicity basis. And that, in that case, the pairing term acquires this px plus i py pairing. That is uh, a little bit unusual because it actually preserves time reversal symmetry. So there are multiple possible ways to actually introduce, uh, introduce superconductivity in, in uh, topological in insulators. You can apply pressure. You can actually add certain dopants, such as copper. Uh, but the focus of this talk will be doing so versus Andreev reflection. If you take a conventional superconductor, such as niobium, 
and place it in good contact with the business selenite such that there's little um, there's, there's a small barrier or non-existent barrier. Then when an electron from the business cell night is incident on the niobium, it'll cause a 2E Cooper pair to occur within the, su within the superconductor. In order to conserve charge, a hole is retroflected in the opposite direction, and these electron hole correlations mimic su superconductivity within the business cell night up to some limited distance, which is typically, which is thought to be at most a few hundred nanometers. Now, if you take a second niobium uh, lead and place it in close contact with the first one, then these electron hole pairs can actually cause, um, through, through interference with each other, can cause a series of, of discrete bound states, known as, known as Andreo bound states. And, they, and these Andreo bound states can actually uh, mediate a dissipationist supercurrent from, from one lead to the other, essentially creating a topological Joseph's injunction. Uh, so that system in particular is quite, in, is quite interesting. Um, as uh, Liang Fu and uh, Charlie Kane noticed that if you actually consider the um, Andre of bound spectrum between two such leads as a function of phase, you get this relationship. You, you uh, label each individual state as a function of um, not only the phase difference, but also a c as a function of Q, which is the momentum along um, the leads. And you note that most of these, uh, these Andre of bound states, the energy is 2 pi periodic with respect to phase uh, difference across the junction. But for Q equals 0, you actually get two separate modes that are 4 pi periodic, which is a very unusual. And every time you have um, an odd integer pi um, phase difference across the junction, these two modes cross and, um, at zero energy, and they essentially form your Myron or fermions. Um, if you consider so-called trijunctions, actually three different leads coming together, and you apply the right phase differences, you can actually mimic a vortex, and it will have a localized Majorana mode at zero energy in, in the center. And then this, this will be confined by, uh, by, by the fact that there's an energy gap and these three other uh, segments of leads every, every time they don't ha have a pi phase difference. And if they do have a pi phase difference, then the, gaps the gap along either the one of those segments collapses, and actually the Majorana mode can escape. And you can use this sort of phase tuning to actually shuttle around Majorana modes and implement uh, the non-abelian uh, um, braiding. Okay. So just to move on to experimental techniques, um, our group at Illinois actually first started off using um, high-quality um, MBE-grown films of business selenide, uh, grown by uh, Sanjik O oh at Rutgers. Uh, but the problem is that those films are sort of low, um, small, can only produce like sort of one tel 10 millimeter square at a time, so they're kind of lo um, low in supply. Uh, to create a large number of devices, we actually uh, switched as, in p as a parallel project to using single crystals of uh, business cell night grown by our collaborator, Yusan Hor. We use conventional uh, exfoliation techniques to uh, peel off thin flakes, the business cell night. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite exfoliate as well as graphene. Instead of seeing flakes that are tens of microns wide, we only see things that are of order one micron or even less that are wide. We exfoliate onto a silicon, silicon dioxide substrate that can act as a vacate, and we use conventional e-beam lithography to, to define both gold and superconducting leads. And an important part of our fabrications act, we actually use in situ argon ion milling right before deposition of the metals. That actually helps to etch away any sort of native oxides that might appear on the business cell night. And it helps us to give it very good transparent contacts between the metal and the business cell night. We take, of course, we take our chips, put it in our custom made printed circuit boards, and put it in our uh, cryogen free dilution refrigerator. Uh, these are the typical uh, material parameters for the thin flakes. Um, that are typically somewhere between 10 and 100 nanometers. Uh, you can see the mobilities are not quite as high as even the initial uh, mobilities quoted for graphene. The carrier densities are also, carrier density uh, measurements are also a, li a little bit higher, but about a order of magnitude higher than graphene. Um, it's, it's thought to be because there's a large number of bulk dopants in the business cell night, and that seems to d dominate the normal state transport. However, the, however um, due to the um, helical nature of the of the, um, of the business cell night, we typically see very long coherence lengths of order of a micron or so at, uh, at the base temperature of our dilution refrigerator. So that implement allows us to do phase current transport in our devices. Um, we had initially done a number of tests using um, to look for the Josephson effect in, in our uh, topological insulators. Uh, it's not that really the, the focus of our talk, 
but we see clear signs of induced superconductivity that comes from a, uh, when we drive a current from one lead to the other we s and measure the voltage drop at the same time, we see this zero res um, voltage current that has a characteristic um, critical current when it switches to the normal state. Normal state. You can see that this, this, this zero resistance state qu quite quickly drops away by the time you reach two Kelvin or so. Another hallmark of the Joseph's effect that we do also see is the uh, the phase sensitive properties. We can create uh, multi connected devices, which are squid-like devices, where the c we actually have two uh, Joseph's junctions uh, conducting in in uh, parallel, and we apply an outer plane magnetic field. We see um, a, a um, an interference effect. We both see rapid oscillations that corresponds to magnetic flux added to this, this squid loop. Um, every time there's um, odd number, sorry, um, half, sorry, pi over two, um, one half or uh, inertia mul sorry, one half or three halves, whatever, flux quantum w within the loop, we, we get uh, a pi phase shift between the two and the, um, we get nearly perfect, but not totally perfect, cancellation between the two um, Joseph's junctions. You get a minimum that corresponds to the squid node. There's also th uh, these, these squid oscillations are um, invo enveloped in a Fraunhofer-like diffraction pattern that correspond to mad negative flux and, and thus phase winding within the individual junctions. Um, the anomalies that occur within these, uh, this interference pattern is described in these two different papers. Um, they can actually be linked to low energy Andrea bound states and maybe or may, may or may not be in Myron and fermions. Um, but I won't talk about that here. I just mentioned those two papers. But one thing I will say is that when we take a look at the gate dependence of this critical current, we see a couple of unusual things. One is that for the longest period of, of gate range, um, we see essentially a flat critical current that with some uh, fluctuations due to uh, premature switching to the, to the finite voltage state. And then all of a sudden, at some critical top gate bias, the critical current drops dramatically and then starts to evolve very slowly. What's interesting is that th this critical top gate bias occurs more or less at the same value independent of the thickness of the device. And secondly is that if you take a look at the normal state resistance, it's typically either unchanged, as the case of those two devices, I don't, I don't actually plot it there because it's kind of an uninteresting uh, plot, or it just smoothly varies in the case of this low density device. That seems to suggest that even though the normal state transport is dominated by the, the bulk carriers, the critical, the supercurrent seems to occur seems to be very strongly um, coupled or tuned by the top gate and thus could be some sort of surface effect. Okay, So those were just um, data from the Joseph's injunctions. Uh, I want to talk about um, spectros spectroscopic and interference uh, phenomena that you would expect to see when in these hybrid devices. For example, people considered a, a, uh, a disk of superconducting material on top of your topological insulator, and when they gap it out with a ferromagnet, it confines a series of chiral edge modes that are es essentially like Meyer and fermions. In particular, every time you have an odd number of vortices within the superconducting island, uh, you'll, there'll be one Meyer on a mode uh, confined there, but also be a second one encirculating the, the device. That's because you have to have an even number of Meyer modes because you start off with direct fermions and those direct fermions can split off to, to create one or more pairs of Meyer fermions. The upshot is that every time there is an odd number of vortices within the, uh, trapped within the superconducting island, there should be um, a zero energy mode that can be detected spectroscopically, spectroscopically through uh, tunnel probes at the edge. And le that leads to a robust zero energy peak. Uh, you can make that geometry a little bit more complicated by actually taking uh, two different um, ferromagnetic uh, domains, um, uh, putting on either side of a superconducting island. Um, because they break time reversal symmetry in two different directions, th at, uh, at the domains, domain wall, there'll be a, a charged uh, chiral edge channel. And then when it hits the superconducting region, it actually causes a pair of counterpropagating Meyer and fermion type edges that encircle your superconducting island and recombine. And the idea is that this sort of ge geometry can create, um, can allow you to electrically detect Meyer fermions, because once again, every time there is um, a vortex with a Meyer fermion um, um, <coughs> bound to the superconducting island, then the Meyer fermions that, in that encircle it will, uh, will do something analogous to a braiding operation. They encircle it and they cause, a, um, they acquire a particular phase uh, difference, a pi, a pi phase shift every time there's an odd number 
of vortices pinned within the superconducting island. And then it causes a sort of a novel Z2 interference um, effect. So that just probes the, the number of Mar uh, Majoran fermions. If you actually want to sort of read out the charge state, you actually have to do some sort of complicated aeronov cacher effect. Uh, for example, you create uh, an, a very unusual sort of Josen-like device where there are multiple jo um, Josen junctions connected in parallel or, or in series. You drive current through it uh, and, and then apply an outer plane electric field so they're actually uh, Josen's vortices. If you drive a current that through the, through the Magnus force, it actually drives vortices around um, this island right here that will recombine and do uh, an interference effect. Um, and the idea is that um, dual to the aeronov bone effect, every time um, you, you change the charge within this island, the, the transport properties of the vortices encircling the island will oscillate. Uh, um, however, if you have um, a magnetic vortex with a Majoran fermion pinned ins inside, then this interference effect will disappear. And this should be a smoking gun detection of the Majoran, of the Majoran of fermion. The only problem is that even the basic aeronov cacher effect that, that you want to detect in this geometry is very hard to do. And only a few groups have been able to do it. And it's not really all that clear if you can do that in business cell night. But I just put this as, as a possible experiment that one would like to eventually do. But I want to take a step back and go to these more simpler uh, interferometers um, and ask, you know, how can we actually make these sort of devices? And this, and you note that you that this requires uh, answering another question, a number of questions. One is that can you get the ballistic transport that is required for these interference effects? Can you actually observe Fabry Pro interferences in the topological insulators? And then. If you, if you can, like how do those resonances interact with superconductivity? How do they top and backgate? And what happens when you apply a magnetic field, which is necessary to pin the vortices within these superconducting islands? So I talk about first a uh, simple set of experiments with simple devices, Andreas spectroscopy devices. Once again, comp uh, comprising of just uh, two leads, one gold lead and one uh, superconducting niobium lead. And they're placed very closely t together. It's close enough you can actually have phase current transport and indeed quasi-ballistic transport between the two leads. These are the typical dimensions, the length and the width of the devices. And for, the, for here, we use somewhat thin p uh, flakes, 10 to 20 nanometers, thin enough that, we, that the, two, uh, the top and bottom layers should be decoupled. These are some micrographs of our some typical devices. This is an AFM picture uh, with a sort of naturally occurring business cell um, nano ribbon with a very small uh, gap between the gold and, and niobium lead. We can deposit um, aluminum oxide over everything in order to ap apply a top gate bias, and we can actually also back gate from underneath. Uh, underneath. Uh, these are some typical spectra taken at zero magnetic field. You can see a number of features. One is that there's enhancement of conductance below the superconducting gap of the niobium, which is connected to injury reflection. Every time there's incident charge, it actually causes 2E charge to be transferred into the niobium. And so that ideally would cause a doubling of the conductance uh, near zero energy. However, you, you note that in fact, near zero energy, there's a downturn of the conductance and it seems to uh, go back down to, to almost the normal state resistance in the limit of zero energy and zero temperature. That is known as the re engine resistance effect. It, it occurs due to a competition between Andreev reflection and the proxy-induced in energy gap. The energy gap de decreases the number of um, states that are available for transport, and turns out they perfectly cancel each other out. The width of this feature is given by what is known as the Thales energy, uh, an idea of the cleanliness um, of, the, of the device. You can estimate it from independent measurements of, um, of hull bars to get the diffusion constants. And for this separation between the two leads, that is L, we get an estimate of the thalus energy of about 160 microvolts, which, uh, which compares well with what we actually observe. Now we can tune the chemical potential with a back gate. And what I have is a sort of grayscale plot of the conductance versus source strain bias and back gate bias. And if I take the same, um, sorry, you, you see the both the re resistance effect and the injury of reflection features near zero energy. But if I take the same data and shift the color scale in order to accentuate the features at high bias, you can see the signs of this checkerboard pattern that is characteristic of a, fa of a Fabry Pro interference. See it more carefully, I can, uh, sorry, more clearly, I can put a series of, eye, of eyes, sorry, lines as guide to the eye. But you note at, uh, at energies below the superconducting gap, you see a second um, 
the checkerboard pattern with a different frequency as, as you do at high bias. You can see this more clearly by just taking, uh, by fixing the source strain bias, measuring conductance, and subtracting out a slowly varying background. When you do, you see a, a series of evenly spaced um, Fabry Pro in, um, oscillations at high bias with a clear periodicity about uh, of one volt on the back gate. But if you go to source strain biases below uh, the energy gap of niobium, we see a doubling of the frequency. And you can see that a bit more clearly if you take the FFT of these two different. Uh, uh, plots. And this can be understood as actually a rather um, elegant interplay between Fabry Pro uh, resonances and Android reflection. If you're at high source strain bias, you just have a normal Andre, uh, sorry, Fabry Pro interference effect where an electron can either go in and transmit right through the, through the uh, cavity. But if there's a finite amount of reflection at the cavity edge, then the electrons has some probability of reflecting and hit the far edge where it'll return and interfere with the instant electrons. Um, and acquire a, a phase difference that's proportional to twice the length of the cavity. And every time that phase difference is some 2 pi n uh, multiple, then you'll get constructive interference and enhancement of conductance. Otherwise, you'll get, you get destructive interference and reduction of the conductance. Um, using a sort of a linear approximation um, for the dispersion relation relationship, you can actually convert that to, to energetic uh, periodicity. Um, what we observe is 0.8 millivolts, which you expect from just gr um, sort of um, gross me measurements fr from ARPIS, you actually get something something a bit larger, 3.8 millivolts. Although we under we learned later on that closer to the Fermi energy, um, the Fermi velocity is renormalized towards larger values due to inter interactions with bosonic modes, such as phonons, and that actually causes an increase of the Fermi velocity as much as a factor of four, which causes the two number what we observe and what you expect to, to agree with each other a bit more. But for energies below the superconducting gap, when electrons are incident upon the niobium, we have instead, not instead of, a, instead of a normal reflection, we have Andrea reflection, where the electrons are retroflected as holes. The holes hit the far side and return, but the holes do not directly inter interfere with the instant electrons. Instead, they Andrea reflect again as electrons, and they return, and now they can actually interfere. But now we have quantum interference between uh, particles where the phase difference is now four times the cavity length instead of twice. This causes a factor of two change in the periodicity of the resonances, which is exactly what we observe and reported. Uh, let's see. So before moving on, I should note there's actually a number of complications in business selenite in particular. Uh, that there's actually a variety of different uh, carriers that are present, not just the helical uh, topological states that we're interested, but there's also a, a series of trivial states in both the bulk and also trivial uh, two eggs that are possible in uh, at the surface. And so there's a question of the the phase coherent transfer that we're actually observing. Where do they? Where does it actually come from? Does it come from the top surface, the bottom surface, or from the bulk? One possible way you can actually sort of answer this question, or at least gain some insight, is to take a look at a variety of devices with different amount of um, normal state conductance. Uh, which we believe is to be dominated um, by the bulk carriers. And so these different devices have different amounts of bulk dopants. In all the devices, we see um, regularly spaced Fabry Pro interferences that, is, that appear on this, back, this slowly varied background that, do, that comes from universal conducting fluctuations. But you know that despite the you know, two orders of magnitude difference in the, con um, the, the background conductance, the magnitude of the oscillations are essentially the same. It's just a few tenths of E squared over H, which seems to suggest they come from a fixed number of states, possibly due to surface states. Now, as I mentioned, in, in some of our devices, we have both top gates and back gates, so we can actually tune the chemical potential from the top or the bottom. When we take one gate trace, uh, when we keep the back gate fixed and measure the conductance versus top gate bias, we see one set of resonances. When we start applying a bias to the back gate bias, Sorry, but to the back gate, we start to, and we read the measurement, we see the same set of resonances, but they're shifted. They're in fact, they're shifted linearly with respect to the bias applied to the back gate. You can see this more clearly if you do a color plot of the conductance versus both top gate bias and back gate bias, and they seem to occur actually along lines of constant carrier density, as opposed to um, occurring either along, along lines of either um, constant top gate bias or constant backgate bias. This seems to suggest that the actual the resonances can be tuned quite e uh, equally by both the top gate or, or the back gate. 
And this is consistent with actually previous measurements of just the, the normal state resistance when they tried to do the same plot but just looked for the presence of a Dirac peak occurring in ch charge neutrality. They actually saw a similar thing. Uh, I'm sorry? But they seem to actually additionally change. Uh, that's that's an interesting feature. They they more th um, there do there does seem to be some dependence on what I guess is essentially the displacement current on the on the anti-symmetric um, difference. Uh, that could be due to the fact that the two la um, there could be some features that do str more strongly couple to either the top gate or back gate, and that is a, some background that that seems to uh, affect the visibility of the resonances. Uh, that actually segs to the next slide, where in, in, in at least one device we see actually two sets of resonances. One that actually has um, these sort of more flat, flatter lines actually has the, um, the slope that corresponds to resonances that are equally tuned by either the top gate or the back gate. But there's a, a second set of resonances that couple more strongly to the back gate. Um, that seems to suggest two different types of carriers that would be in two different types, sorry, two different locations of the devices. Um, for example, the, um, these states could, uh, that are more strongly tuned by, by the back gate, they could actually occur underneath uh, one of the metallic leads that only partially screens out the top gate bias. Okay. Uh, I have a few more minutes, so I want to uh, turn to the uh, neurobome type interferometer uh, measurements. When we place a very small uh, disk of niobium uh, between two closely spaced um, aluminum leads. This looks like a donut. That's because this is sputtered niobium, so we actually have these dog ears that uh, curl up and cause this sort of um, brighter appearance along the edge. Uh, we cover the whole thing with, once again, aluminum oxide and a, a, a deposit a gate on top. And the dashed line, uh, sorry, the dashed line is the outline of the business cell night flake. When we take a look at these devices, um, we see, once again, very prominent Fabry-Pro interferences. They actually have a very intricate pattern where the, uh, the periodicity of the Fabry-Pro uh, uh, resonances become smaller and smaller as you go to closer and closer to zero uh, gate, sorry, sor zero source strain uh, bias. In fact, in some of the devices, we can actually see uh, Fabry-Pro uh, resonances that have spling on the order of 160 microvolts, which sort of demonstrates the high, the, um, the high quality um, quasi-ballistic transport we can observe. Because in, in most typical uh, mesoscopic devices, the Fabry-Pro resonances they report are typically in the millivolt range. When you apply a magnetic field at a plane uh, that is perpendicular to the business cell night, in measure conductance, we see the sort of regularly occurring uh, oscillations in the conductance. If we subtract out a slowly varying background, you actually see something that is uh, more or less sinusoidal and, and periodic. In this particular device, it has a periodicity of around 200 millitesla. But what's unusual is that if you actually take that periodicity and uh, associate it with a, an area corresponding um, that's in enclosed by H over E flux and convert that back to um, Sorry, to an area. It's an area that corresponds mostly to the size of the superconducting disk and not the, t the whole topological insulator itself. That seems to suggest that whatever area of interest it actually seems to more, more or less correspond to the superconductor. And that means that whatever oscillations we observe could actually occur due to states that very closely hug the, um, the edge of the superconductor. If you take a look at what happens to the Fabry-Pro interferences, um, we do a color plot of the conductance versus top gate bias and magnetic field, and we see some vague signs of a checkerboard pattern, where we see one set of resonances at zero magnetic field, but every time we add one magnetic flux vortex to the business to the superconductor, there's a pi phase shift, where a local maximum can becomes a local minimum, and a, and vice versa, and another one occurs, another phase shift, a pi phase shift occurs around 200 millitesla. And this occurs more or less periodically, although admittedly, uh, this data is very much obscured by the, the universal conduction fluctuations that act as a background. Uh, we can do further tests of this hypothesis that what we're seeing is our states going around the superconductor. We can actually scale up the area of the superconductor. We can increase it by roughly a f factor of three, and we see actually see a r an associated factor of three change in the periodicity of these, of these pi phase shifts. This, this demonstrates the field periodicity scales with the area of, of, the, of the niobium. Uh, sorry, inversely scales. We can do other tests. We can actually take, uh, take away the doubly connected uh, geometry. For example, we can look at a device where there's a thin, uh, 
a thin, narrow bi uh, nanorubin business cell night with a niobium on the edge of the device. And we see, once again, regularly space Fabry Pro interferences with some other uh, fluctuations uh, from some other background, universal conduction fluctuations. And even at very large magnetic fields, we, the Fabry Pro interferences don't seem to change all that appreciably. The only thing that seems to happen is that the background seems to change as well. You can do, for example, a color plot of um, versus top gate bias and back gate bias. And once again, we don't see any sort of uh, rapid oscillations. We just see the, the evolution from the universal conduction fluctuations in response to the magnetic field. And this is the, and this, the fact that we, um, we see no phase difference despite the fact that we can, we're adding more than one flux quantum within the bare business selenide flake seems to suggest that we actually need um, states intercircling around the whole niobium. And there's another device where, once again, we don't have the doubly, sorry, the multiply connected geometry. Here, the niobium extends all across the entire width of the business selenite, and we see the same thing. We see regularly occurring um, Fabry Pro interferences, but they don't ha seem to have any sort of phase shift, even up to very large mega fields. Once again, fields large enough to, to insert more than one flux quantum within the bare uh, business selenite segments. So uh, I had alluded to the fact that um, we we're actually trying to make a geometry that is similar to this um, this proposed Majorana interferometer, and that is supposed to actually see some sort of pi phase shift every time there's a integer number of flux quantum, sorry, flux uh, vortices within the bit, uh, within the superconductor. However, if you take a look at the field evolution of the Fabry Pro interferences more carefully, you see that the phase shift occurs rapidly but smoothly. That you first have one phase shift, sorry. Uh, you have one set, of, sorry, one set of resonances. They seem to double more or less in, in, in frequency, and then they acquire the pi phase shift. So this is this is smoothly. It's it's inconsistent with a vortex appearing rapidly um, or hysteretically, as you would like for the case for our Majorana and fermion. Uh, I'm just about out of time, so I'll just throw up the the uh, conclusions. Uh, we did, we have the first realization of Fabry Pro interference in topological insulator, which insulators, which is necessary for Majorana interferometry. We see this elegant interplay between Fabry Pro uh, interference and Andrea reflection, and so we, we see this anomaly fa phase shift uh, from a possible Arnold Bohm effect that suggests the, s the presence of some sort of edge states going around the superconductor, although the precise identity of these edge states is, are not quite known. Thank you. Uh, we do have that material, but we haven't gotten around to it. Uh, it it was provided to us later on by the grower. Um, but it seems like uh, there's always concern with the bulk states, but at the same time, the fact that we're dealing with superconductors, the superconductors gap out the trivial states. And so up to uh, the idea, up to some within reasonable limits, the fact that the trivial states doesn't really matter, that we can still get uh, something similar to the a topological superconductor that eventually have Majorana bound modes that are protected. The, uh, these, um, this is not a Josephson effect measure um, uh, that we're looking at. Um, so, and certainly not the Arnold Kasher. Uh, measurement that we're doing, so I'd say it's they're not sensitive. It's only sensitive to magnetic flux, not charge or fermion parity. <laughs> 